him always chokes me up. I can never make it through that hell. I can never sing that hell. You know, I think of all the saints in paradise. Yeah, it chokes me up. Think about my dad up there in heaven. You know, my dad, a good, faithful Christian man, now in paradise with God Himself. And like you who have lost friends and loved ones. I, you know, I haven't lost him, have I? Right? That's a misnomer. That's a, mis that's a mistake. I know exactly where he is. He's in heaven. He's in paradise. He's with all the saints surrounded in God. There it is, throne at his altar, praising and adoring him for all eternity. Right? Amen? Amen. Well, I guess I'm done for today. <laughs> that's my favorite hymn, and I love that one, and I can never sing it without getting choked up. <sighs> so with that, and the Bible says, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Mark 9, 24. There I was standing on the street. Monday morning there in beautiful Gotha, Florida. Had to go over and take care of some personal business and I was standing there in lovely Gotha and who do I see but an individual I know and we stop and we chat and we're talking about this and that and we're relaying and relating to one another the history of Gotha going all the way back to 1879 when Gotha was sounded by German immigrants from the fatherland. My father could even remember when everybody in Gotha spoke German and me and this individual, we are exchanging information and remembering and recollecting. And she said as she was talking, well, I hope that I get to go to heaven because when I get there, I'll get to see so-and-so. And immediately a red flag went up for me. I hope. I hope that I get to go to heaven. Friends and fellow Christians, that stood out to me like a sore thumb. And I stopped her right then and there. And I said, wait a minute, you're a Christian, aren't you? And she says, yes. I said, you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And she said, yes. And you believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross and he suffered and died for you. He shed his blood to wash away all your sin. Do you believe that? And she said, yes. And I said, do you believe that on Easter Sunday morning when the disciples went to the tomb, they found that tomb empty? They saw two angels sitting there who said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen just as he said he would. Do you believe that? And she said, yes. And so I said, why then do you doubt it? And she said, doubt it? I don't doubt Jesus. I don't doubt that he went to the cross. I don't doubt that he overcame death in the grave. I don't doubt that on Easter Sunday the tomb was empty. And I said, oh, yes you do. Because you don't have faith and confidence and trust in your eternal destination. And she looked at me odd, and she looked at me funny, and she said, what do you mean? And I said, I don't say I hope I go to heaven. I say I know that I'm going to go to heaven. And she said, well, how can you be so sure? I said, it's easy because Jesus told me so. And she said, really, does Jesus talk to you? And I said, oh yes, he certainly does. Every single day, every single moment of the day, every single time that I open the Bible, God speaks to me through his word. There it is in black and white. It is an ironclad contract. Jesus says, believe in me, and you will have eternal life. What does the Bible say? John chapter 14. You probably know it by heart. If you don't know it by heart, you should. In my Father's house are many rooms. 
Another translation says, in my father's house are many mansions. So depending upon your cleaning abilities, you might want a room or you might want a mansion and a vacuum to go along with it. The point is, you're going to be there in heaven with God himself. In my father's house are many rooms. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. Right? Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to go home and fix up my bedroom. He doesn't say, I'm going to get a big screen TV or maybe an Xbox gaming system, and I'm going to go, and I'll see you all later. I'm going to go enjoy my father's house. No, I am going because I still have work to do. I asked last week, I ask yet again today, how many of you have seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Raise your hand. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, you really need to see it. It is a powerful, powerful message of the ministry, the passion of Jesus Christ for us. Think about that. He was consumed with passion for you and me. And you get, and everybody talks about the crucifixion scene. It's graphic. It's brutal. It's, it's disturbing to watch that. I'll never forget the very first time I saw it. I saw it in the theater. I actually spent money. Can you believe that? Spent money to go see this movie. And they're nailing Jesus to the cross. Well, first they scourge him, they whip him, they brutalize him, and oh, wow, all this, this terrible violence, wow, and blood and gore. And then they go to nail him to the cross. And I looked away. I, I, my mind just couldn't take it anymore. I, I looked away and I thought, no, he endured it. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it. And there was this great big biker guy sitting right next to me. Great big muscles, great big broad chest. He had on this leather vest, you know, and, you know, tattoos up and down his arms. And tears were just flowing, flowing down his face. But the scene that sticks with me the most is the final scene. Because what do you see? Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has died. He has been put into the tomb. And the very final... I shouldn't give it away, should I? Okay. Shouldn't give it away. Shouldn't give it away. I'm going to give it away. You know how it ends. Read the Bible. I mean, you know, you, you should know how it ends, right? Actually, you should know how it begins. Because what's the very last scene we see in that movie? We see Jesus sitting up there in the tomb. The stone rolls away. He looks at the camera. James Caviezel, the actor, he looks at the camera. And it's not with a happy face. It's not with a, hey, I won. It's with a look of determination. A look of determination. That's the very look, I believe, that Jesus had when he walked out of the tomb. Because he's not done, is he? He's not finished. It's not over with. It's not like, okay, I got that one done. What's next? Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, Jesus got up out of the tomb. He went and visited with his followers, and then he did what? He had to go to heaven to get his house ready for company. That, my friends, is you and me. And we know that. We know that. We know that. Why then do we doubt it? That's basically what you're doing when you say, I hope, I sure do hope so. The more I talked to this woman, the more it occurred to me, because, you know, I knew her, and she's kind of a friend of mine. You know, an acquaintance would be a better way to describe it. Not a good friend, but an acquaintance. And the more I talked to her and the more questions I asked, you know, well, how are you going to go to heaven? Well, through Christ. And I said, okay, great, then there's no problem. You should, you should express that faith with confidence. And, and then what did she say? Well, I've tried to live a good life. Well, so did Gandhi, all right? There's a lot of people in the world that try to live a good life and they're not believers and they're not Christians and they will not be in heaven, plain and simple. I can't put it any more simply or plainly than that. You have to believe in Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're the greatest neighbor ever. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you have damned yourself, okay? People that aren't believers, they'll say, you know, hey, how can your God send people to heaven? Why does your God, I'm sorry, why does your God send people to hell? What kind of a loving God would send people to hell? God, hear me clearly, God does not send people to hell. 
they send themselves. Okay? They send themselves. There are two very clear choices when it comes to eternity. Heaven and hell. All right? There's no in-between. There's no limbo. There's no, no purgatory. You know, no happy hunting ground. No Valhalla. Heaven or hell. And if you want to go to heaven, Jesus says, come on in. And if you don't want to be with Jesus Christ, the only other place to go is hell. That, my friends, is the stark choice with eternity. Heaven or hell. And yet we struggle with that. Why do we doubt? I forgot to bring it with me today. How many of you, like unto myself, threw two dollars away a couple of weeks ago on a lottery ticket? I did. I did. Yeah, you know, it was 1.6 billion. 1.6 billion with B. 1.6 billion. I thought, well, what the heck? You know, and I went down to the gas station and I gave the guy my two bucks and he typed it into the computer and I said, you know, I don't even know what numbers to pick. You pick them. Apparently he picked the wrong ones. <laughs> I ought to go ask him for my two bucks back. And I kept that little ticket. And I was going to bring it with me today. I, I didn't even get one number, all right? <laughs> is it possible that the reason we doubt, the reason we struggle is because we've been disappointed so often in life? You know, you read about a great recipe and you say, you know what, I'm going to try that. And you get all the ingredients together and you mix it up in a pot or a bowl or a pan and you put it on the stove or you put it in the oven and you look at the Betty Crocker picture and this is going to be so great and the family's going to love it and you pull it out and something went wrong and it's horrible and nobody will eat it and you throw it in the trash and you say, I'll never try that one again. Case in point, do you know that I used to be a great cooker of cornbread? Sure did. Yeah, I've made cornbread in years. My last experience ruined me, and I haven't gone back since. Had a, had a cast iron skillet dedicated. All I would make in this cast iron skillet was cornbread. And I'm going to mix up a batch of cornbread one time. And I, I bought the cornmeal, and I took it home. Alabama Pride, by the way, is my brand. Alabama Pride. If you happen to be in Winn-Dixie, you'll find it there. And I went home, and I read on the back of the package, they had this sour cream and onions cornbread bread recipe and I thought that sounds kind of tasty and so I followed the recipe line by line word by word measurement by measurement I mixed it all up I poured it into the pan I put it in the oven turned the oven on I came back I pulled the skillet out of the oven and it was powder yeah I don't know what happened I don't know what happened it, it wasn't cooked. It was like it was just a great big pan of powder. It had cooked all the moisture out of it. And so what did I do? I took all the powder out of the skillet. I put it back in a bowl. I added some more stuff and I put it back in. And, and when I pulled it out, you guess what it was? It was powder. I never could get it to cook. And so I just quit. I gave up. I threw it in the trash and I haven't cooked cornbread since then. It ruined me. Oh, exactly. Oh, maybe I'll cook cornbread again one day. Yeah, and you know what? That's what everybody's going to carry away from the sermon. Pastor's going to make us all cornbread. Imagine communion next week, right? Yeah. You ever had something like that happen to you? A recipe went south, a project didn't work, the nail didn't hold, the screw didn't bite, the glue didn't tack. We live with disappointment with failure and it doesn't feel good and maybe that taints us maybe we live with disappointment in the sense of we're just not good enough Friday Friday this past Friday the school had its fall festival celebration see we can't call it Halloween anymore and so it has to be a fall festival but we went we took the grandbabies they had all these games set up and you have to buy tickets to play the games so Papa bought 20 bucks worth of tickets and the failure was they set up all the games right next to the playground equipment and what did all the kids do they ran through the gate and they played on the playground the whole time 
time. And so I walked around the fall festival, and I won two pencils and a lollipop. Because by golly, I paid for these tickets, and I'm going to use them. I got a hot dog as well. And I was watching, as I'm eating my hot dog, I'm watching my granddaughter run with all her little buddies all over the playground. And she is a natural runner. Her movements are just totally and completely fluid. I was never a good runner. I never could run very well. You know, when I ran, it was like I was attacking the ground with my feet. But she's just running so smooth. And I told her that afterwards. I said, Angela, you know, maybe you could be a track star. You could be in track and field when you get into high school. You're great. You're wonderful. You're fantastic. Did anybody ever tell you that you weren't? I think all of us have had that experience. I couldn't run and my coach told me so. I couldn't shoot basketballs, and so I was not on the basketball team. There's a lot of things that I'm just no cotton picking good at. And there were plenty of people through my life who told me so. I imagine the same thing happened to you. You're not the first one picked for the ball team, are you? You don't win the blue ribbon at the prize at the fair. And maybe somehow that, that translates into our life when it comes to eternity. I'm not good enough. I got news for you. You're not. You're not. You're not. You are not good enough to win eternal life. That, my friends, is the beauty of the gospel. I'm not good enough, and I don't have to be. Because the perfect one, the one who was most excellent, Jesus Christ, he came into the, into the world to, to suffer and die for me. He was the one who was not only good enough, he was perfect enough, right? He went to the cross and he said, Glenn, I'm doing this for you. I will suffer, I will die, I will shed my righteous blood. That righteous blood will wash away all your sin. And when I overcome death and the grave, wait for it. Three days from now, I'm not going to be in this tomb. Nobody believes me. They're going to come, and they're going to be ready to prepare my body properly for burial because on Good Friday, it was a rush job. The sun was going down. The Sabbath was about to begin, and they had to just kind of wrap me up and cram me in. But you know what? I'm glad they didn't waste a lot of time because I was only going to be here for a little while. They came in doubt, not believing that I would keep my word. But I rose in victory and overcame death in the grave. The proof being the empty tomb and the nail marks on my hands and my feet, the spear mark in my side. Remember Doubting Thomas? Boy, imagine having that name for all eternity. What does Jesus say? Behold, my hands, my feet, my side. Stop doubting, says Jesus Christ, and believe. I hope. To me, that's a, a major red flag. I got some Bible verses I want to share with you. What time is it? Oh, I got plenty of time. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. You guys got an extra hour's worth of sleep, so we can spend an extra hour in church today, can't we? Yeah. Did anybody actually sleep the extra hour? Not me. No, the old body clock woke me right up. I even tried to go back to sleep. I laid there like this. I am going to get the extra hour. Didn't work. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. 
Think about your concept of the judgment day, right? You're standing before God. He's at a desk like a judge. He's got that gavel in his hand. He's opened the book of life, your name in it. Here comes all the questions. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? Not according to that word of God has not been what? Judged, but has passed from judgment to life. Jesus took the judgment on the cross. When you and I die and stand before God, the only word we will hear from God himself is, Welcome home! It's great to see you. Whoever believes in the Son has, has, present tense, has, not will have, has eternal life. You've already got it. There you go, Ron. Here, hold on to that. I'm giving that to you. I'm giving that to you. Yes, take it home with you. See, this side of the church feels neglected. All right. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift from God. You cannot earn it, says Paul, not by works, so that no one can boast. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give. Okay? And I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. John chapter 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Does everybody here believe in Jesus? Yes. Say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Jesus, is Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I confess that through the cross he has redeemed me. Then you're saved. See how easy that is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I made this one especially for Roy. Let me get over to Roy. And the reason that I made this specially for Roy, you see what I write on? He threw these away and I had to dig them out of the trash. Yeah, yeah. So I made him a special card just for him. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, says Paul. What does that mean? It's not political power. It's not military power. It's not physical power. Paul is talking about all the demons in hell. Every single demon could come up out of hell and assault you. And Paul says, you know what? It will not separate you from what? The love of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, nor any power, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to frame that and put it in your office, okay? Amen. And you know what you can do? You could even frame it this way, this way to know where it came from. <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, says Jesus, he who believes has eternal life. He who believes has eternal life. Where am I at? Have I given it here? I'm like, I got one more. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I'm going to give this one all the way over here. There you go. <laughs> Didn't know you'd be part of the sermon today, did you? Yeah. I hope. I hope. I know. I know. I know that Jesus Christ died for me. I know that Jesus Christ overcame death in the grave. I know that when I die, it will not be the end. When they close the lid on my coffin and put me down in that ground, put me in a hole six feet long and three feet wide and six feet deep, that's not the end. That's not the final moment. That, my friends, is the beginning of my time in paradise itself. And I don't hope, I know that when that day and moment and minute comes, not only will I see Christ himself, not only will I stand before God and be welcomed, I know 
that on that day I will see every single saint who has gone before me. As Thomas Jefferson said to John Adams, when Abigail Adams passed away, there we will have that ecstatic meeting where we will meet those whom we have loved and lost, whom we shall still love and never lose again. Friends and fellow Christians, with that I say, Amen.